something I thought was funny, thought you might. It says, Mexican word of the day, chauffeur. I've worked hard all my life, but feel that I don't have much to show for it. <laughs> and then I, I re-found this. I found this, and I've shared it before. I don't know if you recall it or not. You've, seen, you've heard the, uh, the poem, uh, Footprints in the Sand? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, this one says this. One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen. The footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prints appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they're too big to be my feet. <laughs> my child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow. The walk of faith you would not know. So I got tired and I got fed up. There I dropped you on your butt. <laughs> because in life there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb. When one must rise and take a stand or leave one's butt prints in the sand. <laughs> and there's a message in there somewhere. I want to talk to you for a little while today about drawing from God's grace. What I'm going to be sharing with you is a revelation that I got this week. Yes, I just want to tell people, that noise is there's a guy next door working on the roof. I know everybody keeps looking at the wall, but that's what that noise is. Yeah. They're making the, uh, the unit next door into a restaurant. I don't know what kind, but it's going to be a restaurant. And uh, we met this guy a little earlier before we uh, started the, the session today. And he said, I'm going to try to hold off on doing the roof work uh, until you dismiss. And I thought, well, that's, that's very kind of you, and I appreciate that. Yes. And uh, I invited him to come uh, to the Bible study, and he said, I promise you, I will come. Yes. Mm -hmm. I will come. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's what that's the what racket is. Yeah. Thank you, Kay. People yeah. might have thought. Everybody kept looking. I thought they don't know. They might have thought the termites were just getting bigger. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm going to share with you this morning is a revelation that God has been showing me that you need to understand along with me. It revolutionized my understanding of some of the principles of the giftings and callings of God. So I want to share it with you because I think you'll be just like I am. You'll be glad to know this. James chapter 4, verse 8, the Word of God says, Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. The word draw there in the Greek language has, has this meaning. To attract, to pull, to invite, to beckon, to tug, to entreat, to engage to siphon, to call forth, to make demand upon. And that's not a, you know, like an angry demand. It's like, you know, to call something that's due to call it due. But that's what the word draw, and it says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh unto you. So that means to to endeavor to get close to God and to pull God close to you to come together. And uh, I was thinking about that in relationship to some things, and uh, my mind came across something that I read years ago about lightning. Uh, lightning is a, is a powerful force in nature. Uh, a lightning strike can vaporize a tree, just like that. I mean, just 
just make it disappear. Lightning, uh, uh, a lightning strike can carry over a million volts of electricity. A million volts. Lightning strike uh, is usually above 60,000 degrees. I'm talking about some power here. There is more energy in one thunderstorm than there is in a 60 ton, 60 megaton atomic bomb. Mm. So who has the power? God. Mm -hmm. The creator. But here's the thing that a lot of people don't know about lightning. Through infrared cameras, you can see that during the time of a thunder and lightning storm that the earth puts out a request for a lightning strike. And it's co it comes in the form of what they call a streamer. It's the crust of the earth or a tree or something that's in nature that, and you've got to have a, a special camera to see it, but it'll shoot a small little uh, trickle of lightning upward toward the sky. Most people would never even see it. It just shoots right up. And almost within, j just within a, a split second, a lightning strike will come out of the clouds and strike where, where that little streamer made the request. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about this scripture, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. You make the request to be close to God, and that's where the lightning strikes you. Know, the, the power of God comes there. Because God has designed things in a way that are orderly, and it involves heaven and earth coming together. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Psalms 42 verse 7, we find this scripture. Deep calleth unto deep. At the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows Go over me. Now, David wrote this psalm when he was in captivity. And uh, it's, a, it's a part of a song that he wrote. That's what psalms are, psalms. And it says, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts, or thy, uh, uh, of the places where water is moving or stirring. Now let me read this to you in the paraphrased version. It, it, it's a little more understandable. When it says deep calls unto deep, it says one depth is attracted to another depth. In the rush of thy channels, all of thy flowings inundate me. So what is David saying? Deep calls to deep. Things of likeness attract to each other. You can take a magnet and anything that is of a, of, of a metal nature, uh, except aluminum, aluminum is not, uh, it's, it's not considered really metal, but a magnet will be attracted to that thing and that thing will be attracted to the magnet. As a matter of fact, if that magnet, if you take a paper clip and put a magnet close to it, it'll jump up to the, to the magnet. Then if it stays there long enough, it will actually get some of the magnetism and you can take that paper clip that's on that uh, magnet and put it down it'll pick up another magnet. That paper clip will. So it, it, it is a likeness or a kinship in things that draws them in togetherness. And that's what David's talking about here. 
He's talking about deep calls unto deep. So the, the God part of you calls unto God. The earth part of you calls unto the, the earth. But the God part of you calls unto God. And God designed things that way. So draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That's the way it works. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, so, so keep your mind sharp. You ever see the movie The Field of Dreams? Yes. With Kevin Costner and how that uh, he heard this whisper. He was a farmer out in Iowa and grew a lot of, just a lot of acreage of corn and stuff. And all of a sudden he heard this whisper and said, build it and he will come. Build it and he will come. I've heard it misquoted to say, build it and they will come, but it didn't say that. It said, build it and he will come. And, you know, he built a ball field out in the middle of a cornfield. And uh, ball players from past decades started coming out of that cornfield and playing ball at night. I don't have to rehearse the story. You, you, you know it. But build it and he will come. And, and the story ends up that uh, his father was a young ball player and uh, he never really got to, to know his father because he died. And all of those ball players that were coming out of the corn were dead and gone. But as a matter of fact, one of those ball players asks him one night as they've come out to play some ball, he says, is this heaven? He said, no, it's Iowa. <laughs> But uh, anyway, the, the, the thing was, his daddy showed up as a part of one of, of, one of the players. And uh, he got to play pitch with his daddy again, and it, and it was a, a healing thing. But people couldn't see them except, you know, the family that lived there. But uh, then, all of a sudden, everybody could see them. But uh, anyway, the, the movie is, build it, and he will come. In other words... Make the effort, and the the thing will respond, you know? And that's certainly true in the world of the Spirit, that whatever we do to draw nigh to God, He will do on His end to draw nigh to us. It's a principle. It's a law. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 24 says this. Elijah had challenged Ahab and Jezebel to gather their prophets up on Mount Carmel because it hadn't rained in three and a half years because Elijah prophesied it. So on Mount Carmel, Elijah said in 1 Kings 18, 24, the God that answereth. Now, take a note. The God that answereth. The God that responds by fire. He's the true God. Now, it wasn't about the fire. It was about the rain. But the fire came first because it was a lightning strike of a storm that was coming. So what this man said is the God that answers by fire. Now what did he do? He built an altar. Put the sacrifice on it. Put the stones in order. Put the wood there. And then poured 12 barrels of water on that altar. In the midst of a, a, of a drought. I, I bet it made some of those people mad for him to be wasting water like that. But what he was doing was. Seeding. He was putting seed there for what he was expecting. You got to prepare to the level of your expectation. That's what faith does. And so he built this altar and then he prayed a short prayer and all of a sudden lightning struck that altar. And as I said earlier, it just vaporized that altar. It licked up the dust, licked up all the water, and uh, uh, Strike, struck the stone, consumed the sacrifice and everything else. 
But I want you to notice the terminology. He said, the God that answers by fire. In other words, I'm putting something out here that is a request for fire. And the God that responds to that, he's God. Well, Baal couldn't do it. None of the prophet, prophets of the grove had any success. They, they tried everything to get their God to respond with fire. And, and their God just was silent. Because he ain't no God, first of all. And so God responded. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. God has designed things in the spirit world that there is movement and there is response. And we need to understand the process so that we can work the laws of the kingdom of God. You can't work a law you're not aware of. Amen. 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 Now, in the, in the natural world, in electricity, you can put a, a socket in a wall and have wires run from the power company to that socket, and the power's in there waiting. All you got to do is plug something into it. But it manifests in different ways. I can plug that, that, that radio system there or a CD system into it and it manifests its power in playing music. Or it can give you a video with this television if you plug into the same socket. Or you can plug this fan into it and it manifests with blowing air. The manifestation varies, but the power source is the same. That's how it is with God. The power source is the same, but it manifests in different ways to accomplish different purposes. And in electrical law, you can have two little wires that are close together with a little gap between them. They're not connected, but there's a little gap between them. And if one of them is electrified or plugged in and the other is not, then if you get them close enough, they don't have to touch, there will be what is called an arc. And the spark will jump from one wire to the other. If you've ever seen uh, uh, anything like that, that's what it was. It was called an arc, A-R-C. The electricity was jumping the gap because something got close enough of kinship nature and it reached out to it. Do you see what I'm saying? The law of nature does that. The law of the spirit is a lot like electricity. Yes, yes. God always responds in like manner as we request. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Now I got your attention. God made all the animals in creation. Made all the plant life. Made all the rocks and the, and the dirt and all of that. And then he made man. Notice this. God said to himself, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Word, God the Spirit. Same, same three. Mm -hmm. Let us make man in our own image. And then he said something that was key. And in our likeness. Let's make him to look the part. But also let's make him like us. Likeness. Kinship. See? So what did God do after he made that man and the man was lifeless? God got him close and the spark jumped 
and ignited, resuscitated this man, and man became a living soul. Why? Likeness was responding to likeness. See, God didn't make angels like him. He made man like him. And the likeness of God in us is what God responds to. God doesn't respond to your flesh. He responds to your spirit. When God got close to Adam, Adam was dead. He was dead. He was, he'd never been alive. He was just a lifeless form. But when God got close enough to his own likeness, the power just went from God to that man. And it went on the wings of his word. His spirit, breath, carried the, the words it, to that man. And the man responded to the life of God. Now that was the beginning of us. And we are still human. And we in Adam we sinned. But in Christ... We repented and got born again in the likeness of God. And what we have to understand is that God wants to respond to us. Okay. When this little lady came behind Jesus in the press of the crowd, Twelve years, been bleeding, hemorrhaging internally. And she'd spent all of her money on physicians and was nothing better. There's a lot of people like that today. They've used up all their insurance. They've used up all their savings. They've used up every penny they've got to, to, to pay doctors, uh, to buy medicine. And they're broke and, and busted and disgusted and sick. That's what this woman was. She was desperate. But she heard about Jesus. And she said to herself, sometimes you got to talk to you. That's right. She said to herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I know that I shall be made whole. She didn't say, I think I will. Or I, 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 I hope I will. Or maybe I will. She said, if I can get there and touch that, make contact, I know I'm going to be made whole. That's faith, y'all. And when she got close enough, she reached out and touched the hem of his garment. Grabbed, actually. The words have to. H-A-P-T-O means to take hold of. She grabbed the hem of his garment, which was... In a, in a uh, rabbi, which Jesus was a rabbi, a teacher, uh, that, that meant uh, uh, she was touching the most anointed part because when you anoint a priest or a rabbi, you pour it on his head, six quarts, and it saturates and puddles in that hem and, and puddles on the ground. So she was reaching for where the anointing settled. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture in your Bible. Listen up now. There's a scripture in your Bible that says the Son of Righteousness has arisen with healing in his wings. Yes. Jesus don't have wings. Angels have wings. Jesus don't have wings. What are the wings it was talking about? In the Jewish culture, the rabbis wear that garment, that ephod, that, uh, that, that holy garment. And it has tassels on the end of, of the hem. And those are called wings. The Son of Righteousness has arisen with healing in his wings. She touched the hem of his garment and guess what happened? Without him planning it, Virtue, the power, the electricity, spiritual electricity that was in him, she plugged into it and it flowed from him to her. 
And immediately she was made whole. What did she do? She got close. And then he got close back. It was a response. Your faith and your faith-filled words bridge the gap and jump over the, 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 the void and lay hold on the reality in the spirit world and pull it back into manifestation. Man, oh man. Look at the natural for a minute. You can take a piece of paper It's got numbers on it, information on it. It's usually got your name on it. You call it a check. It's just a piece of paper with printing on it. And then you write your name on it and write an amount on it. You take it down to the bank and put it through the drive through window or, or, or go in window. Window. <laughs> and go, or go inside and put it through the, the, the teller's window. And guess what? It don't come back as the same piece of paper. It comes back as money. It just changed form when it got close enough to be transformed. See what I'm saying? That's what happens when God and us get close enough. Bam! Bleeding becomes healing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, praise God. Yeah. Pain becomes glory. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago in, in a college class that I had, oh my God, I graduated from college in 1968. I was born at a very early age. <laughs> had a college class. The professor had this uh, beaker on a Bunsen burner. And uh, he turned the heat up and uh, he had an egg, a raw egg. I don't know, it might have been boiled, I don't know. But it was too big to fit into that beaker. It wouldn't go through the, the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. But he put it right up there on the, on the top of that bottleneck, that egg. And he turned the heat up in that beaker. And what did that heat do? It created an atmosphere in that beaker that needed air for the to equalize the pressure. And he kept turning it up little by little bit, and after a while, that egg that would not fit through that opening just said, sucked right into that bottle. Uh -huh. Why? There was an atmosphere created that made a demand on the change of environment to move that thing out of here into here. That's how God works. Supernaturally. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. That's not an iffy thing. That's a, that's a law. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said these people, now you do what I tell you to do. You go to an upper room. And you gather there and you tarry. And you shall be endowed with the power from on high. And they went. And people don't know this, but you can figure out how long they were there. Because Jesus celebrated Passover with them. And then... He went to the cross, was crucified, buried, and on the third day rose again. And Pentecost was a Jewish feast, and it was the 50th day after Passover. 
So those people were there for about 10 days, roughly 10 days, in that upper room waiting. They couldn't leave because they didn't want to miss it. They didn't know when, the, when it was coming. God knew, but they didn't know. So they just tarried, 120 of them. That's an interesting number. It's 10 times 12. That's the number of commandment and the number of government. Multiply. And that's exactly what was happening. The church was being born that day. On the, on the, the, the time, the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, so we know what day it happened, which was 50 days after Passover, There came a sound like a rushing mighty wind, filled all the house where they were sitting. The Spirit of God came, tongues of fire set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost got sucked into the upper room. Why? Because that's the way God designed it. They created the atmosphere by their obedience. They were in the right place at the right time, Yielded and waiting and expecting, and all of a sudden, God responded. Boom! And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And when that happened, they were born again. And that's the day the church began. That's what happened. That Holy Spirit was drawn out of heaven into that upper room because. They drew near to God, and he drew near to them. That's it. Now, I want you to notice that God didn't spill out his spirit. Neither did Jesus spill out his blood. He shed his blood. That's on purpose. Spill is an accident. Spill is an accident. God didn't just spill his spirit out. The Bible says he will pour his spirit out. That means you got something to pour into. Hello. I'm talking about drawing out of God so he can draw out of you. He poured out his spirit on a hundred and twenty empty vessels in that upper room. They were ready. They were waiting. They were yielded. They were obedient. They were open. They were expecting. They were receptive vessels. God wants to fill receptive vessels. Amen. Yes. You got to meet the criteria to get the transfer. That's right. That mm -hmm. outlet over there is not going to give you diddly unless you plug into it like you're supposed to. A closed mind, a closed heart, a closed ear, a closed door is not receptive. A closed hand is a fist, but an open hand is a receptive. You, you, you got to hear, we need to be receptive to God and draw close to Him and let the powers of the other world transfer, spark the gap and ignite something in us that only heaven can do. Earth can't do it. Doctors can't do it. Government officials can't do it. Rich people can't do it. You can have all the money in the world and you can't do it. It takes God to do it. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I'm about to tell you what I've been telling you all this other stuff for. I want to talk to you about spiritual gifts. You ready? Yes. 
1 Peter 4.10 As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That is a very important scripture. I want you to see with me that the gift, as every man hath received the gift. What's the gift? Even so, minister that gift one to another as good stewards of that gift because that gift is the manifold grace of God. Manifold means various and different kinds. There's a lot of different kinds of grace. But it is a gift from God to humanity. And it goes with your calling and purpose in life. Your grace is goes with your purpose. Many different kinds of manifestations come out of that little receptacle over there. According to what the vessel is that's plugged into it. We are all different. We are all unique. We are all called of God. You may not be in a pulpit, but your pulpit may be a computer terminal. Your pulpit may be a truck cab. Your pulpit may be a sewing machine. Your pulpit may be a, a teacher's desk. Your pulpit may be a kitchen. Your, we are all different, and our calling and our purpose does not necessarily fit in the ecclesiastical environment. It's a gift to the world. The fivefold ministry belongs in the church. But it exists according to Ephesians 4 that the saints may be perfected for the work of the ministry. The fivefold ministry is a preparation for those who will go out where the rubber meets the road and influence the world for the kingdom of God. Whatever you do you're supposed to be just as anointed as the preacher or more. And God has a grace that covers what he called you to do. <laughs> See, we, we followed church and religion around mountains for decades. And we've never gotten this. The pew is supposed to be just as anointed as the pulpit. Amen. It's supposed to be just as much power in the pew as there is in the pulpit. It's just different according to the purpose and calling. Do you see what I'm saying? And that is called grace. Grace is not just the favor of God. It is a spiritual gifting. It divinely enables you to carry out whatever it is you're supposed to do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a grace from God. And it carried them through the furnace. Daniel didn't need that kind of grace. He needed lion's den faith and lion's den grace because that's where his path led him. He would have died in the furnace. They would have died in the lion's den. But the grace is sufficient. Paul found it out. Paul was having trouble with with a messenger from Satan and he was praying and asking God, pray three times and ask God, Get me out of this. Get this away from me. Fix this. And God said, my grace is sufficient. I feel chill bumps all up and down my spine. My grace is sufficient. He didn't say his grace was insufficient and Paul was just going to have to deal with it and put up with it and suffer it. No, 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 no. He said, my grace is sufficient to handle this thing. 
I've called you for a purpose. This is not going to stop you. You're going to roll on. The devil wants to stop you. He wants to distract you. He wants to discourage you. He wants to intimidate you. He wants to make you quit. But the grace of God is for you to do what you're here for. You're not just here to follow the shade around the house and to breathe in and out until you die. You're not here for that. You're here for God's purpose. Amen. Ephesians 3, 7. I was made a minister, Paul says, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me. By the effectual working of his power. Now you got to see this. Paul had a special grace from God to do what Paul was supposed to do. It wasn't, it wasn't for Peter, it was for him. Peter had his own grace and his own path and his own doings. And he had grace for but Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And then in Philippians 1, 7, he said, and you are all partakers of my grace. Mm -hmm. As Paul did what he was called and purposed to do, people were the recipients of, and the grace was the gifting upon Paul, and he was able to do what he was called to do. And they were the recipients of his grace. Yes. Yes. You are the only you. There won't ever be another you. You're not called to be second or third or fourth best. You are called to be the best you there could possibly be. And it takes grace to do that. <laughs> grace is the divine enabling, gifting, unmerited favor of God. Grace and favor are the same thing. No difference. Grace and favor are the same thing. Do you see that? Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. By grace, I am what I am, and you're partakers of my grace. 2 Timothy 1, 9. He hath called us with a holy calling according to his, his, his own purpose and grace. That means your purpose has a gifting of grace to go with it. It's like God is, 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 is contracting you to do a job and then he's giving you the tools to do it with. That's what grace is. Your grace is given to fulfill your calling. Well, I don't know what I'm called to do, preacher. Find out. <laughs> Nobody told me I was called to preach. I had to find that out. But I guarantee you, I don't doubt it. I know it. That's the power he gives us. Ephesians 4, 7, and 8. When Jesus ascended up on high and led captivity captive, he gave gifts unto men... And every one of us is given grace according to the gifts of Christ. There's other gifts. There's spiritual gifts. There's, there's uh, uh, the gifts of healings, the gifts of, 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 of tongues, the gift of interpretation of tongues, the gift of wisdom, uh, all kinds of spiritual gifts. But all of them operate out of the law of grace. The unmerited, divine, enabling Favor of God upon your life. Yes. You don't deserve it. You don't qualify for it. God doesn't call the qualified. 
He qualifies the call. Grace is translated from the Greek language charisma. Charisma. And it means a supernatural gifting. A miraculous faculty. A supernatural favor. A spiritual endowment. A spiritual magnetism and beauty. If you are in your grace, if you are in your grace, then you are graceful. Full of grace. The airplane is not made to sit on the tarmac. Nobody designed an airplane to drive it around the streets. Nobody made an airplane to taxi and never leave the ground. It is made to fly. Its purpose is there, not here. It has to come here to let you off and take you on. But it's made for there. That's where it's graceful. It's gawky on the ground. It's clumsy on the ground. It's ugly on the ground. It's bouncy on the ground. But it soars when it gets there because that's its purpose, that's its design, and when it's in its grace, it's attractive. It is the best it can be. And that's how we are. When you are not in the right lane, you are in somebody else's lane. Get out while you can. If God has called you to something, don't try to be something else. 